So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Enrico Pate from uh, uh, DMDP Cambridge and uh, his expertise area uh, basically varies from like started from string theory quantum gravity to at present cosmology. Uh, he's uh, like uh, he did his PhD on string theory from LMU Munich and then he did his two postdocs at Cornell and Princeton University. Then he was a faculty at Utrecht for uh, uh, four years and then he shifted to uh, Cambridge on 2018 and he's continuing right now. Today he's going to talk about a very special topic. Now you can share the screen and uh, uh, it's, it's very sp special topic related to uh, cosmology and it's basically called boostless uh, bootstrap and he, he will talk about a lot of ideas related to uh, his four papers uh, like which are at, which already appeared in this year um, and he will uh, give a overall summary of these works what he's doing in this area hopefully we will learn a lot about this subject and uh, thank you Enrico for uh, uh, like uh, for giving this uh, lecture for this QASTM Zoominar. This is the 57th QASTM Zoominar and um, I am welcoming you uh, for this uh, Zoominar and uh, like we are very thankful to you to have you here. So you can start. Okay, thank you very much uh, Sayantan for the invitation for the opportunity to present uh, present here and, and describe a little bit of the progress that we have been uh, achieving in the, in the past field of cosmology. And um, what I'm going to discuss today is based on, on a series of papers that I had in, in the past year, as, as well as many ideas that have been proposed in the literature in the past few years. So I'll, I'll try to give some, some references. Uh, but first of all, I would like to encourage everyone who's here uh, live in the Zoominar to, uh, to stop me and, and ask questions. Um, I think that makes it uh, most interesting for, for everyone. So um, the main topic is, um, well, the title is Building a Boostless Bootstrap. And maybe I should say one word about each one of these words in the title. Building is because this project is not yet finished. This is a program that I think would take some more effort, but it's showing extreme uh, uh, promises of success uh, early on. And so I, I think we will see more of these ideas in the near future. Uh, bootstrap hopefully will become clear after the first uh, uh, few slides. And bootstrap is the idea that we are gonna try to compute the natural observables of cosmology uh, in a completely different way than, than, than was done in the past. Um, okay, so first of all, I wanted to, uh, to thank my collaborators that really uh, uh, were instrumental in achieving many of these results. Uh, they are uh, Sadra Yazayeri, a postdoc, was here at, in Cambridge and just moved to Paris. Uh, David Stefanizin is a postdoc uh, here in Cambridge, exceptionally talented, uh, um, as well as uh, my grade two PhD students, uh, Jakob Supel and Harry Goodhue, both uh, also here in Cambridge. Um, and so without further ado, let me give you a summary of what I'm going to discuss. I'm going to start with a broad motivation, so at least people can see uh, why, uh, uh, why there is a need for a, for a change of, of paradigm in theoretical cosmology. And, and then specifically, I'll, I'll discuss uh, three, three chapters. One is about the, the symmetries of cosmological perturbations. One is about convincing you that there is an alternative way to compute things that is very different from what you might have learned uh, in cosmology classes. And finally, I'll, I'll show one very exciting result that we recently obtained uh, that is opening up uh, the possibility to study every possible um, correlator in cosmology using these methods. And I'll, I'll conclude with, with an outlook. So the motivation is gonna be quite broad. Um, uh, 
And so this, the, the, this drawing here is like the, a picture from uh, one of the most famous, uh, sometimes cosmology books, so perhaps the most uh, aesthetically beautiful, it's Armonia Macrocosmica by Cellarius. Uh, and it describes here the, uh, the model of, of the universe that was before uh, Copernicus. And of course, we know the idea before was that all of these planets rotated around the Earth, and that was um, um, before the proposal that actually we have in um, heliocentric models and the planets go, go around the center. Uh, and and I, it will become clear in a second why, why, why this is a good, a good start for, for this talk. Uh, so what has become clear in the past 20 or 30 years is that uh, we have the exciting opportunity to look at the sky, measure the distribution of galaxies or of photons in the universe. And by doing that, we're actually using, uh, experimentally measuring uh, quantum correlators that involve perturbative quantum gravity around quasi the sitter space. So we have this exceptional possibility that we can actually measure quantum correlators around the sitter space uh, experimentally. And so we hope that this opportunity will teach us uh, a great deal about fundamental physics. It will teach us about high energy physics, uh, the perturbative regime of quantum gravity, and perhaps some symmetries of the non-perturbative regime. And perhaps it will allow us to discover new particles and new interactions. Um, so how do we usually proceed? Just very broadly speaking, is that as we always do, we are down some models of the early universe and trying to make predictions based on these models. And this has been a, a very active uh, industry in, in research for uh, maybe in the 90s and in the 2000s, but it has become increasingly clear recently that there are way too many uh, models that you can write down of the early, very early universe. Mostly these are models of inflation uh, and they can differ in the particle spectra that they have, the interactions that are involved, the mechanisms. And there are very many of these. However, uh, the type of observations that we get at late times, they're relatively simple and, and reduced. In fact, so far we only have measured uh, three numbers about the primordial universe. And it's uh, clear that there are way too many models uh, for uh, way too, too few observations to actually being able to distinguish model by model what, what happened. And, and the main problem is very clear, is the fact that uh, unlike what happens in particle accelerators, uh, what we can know about the early universe is only its final state, what happened at the very end, because it's the final state of the primordial universe that then sets up uh, the distribution of galaxies and photons in the universe. But we have no one, none of us was there during inflation. And so none of us can know what happened as a function of time. No one can observe the time evolution. We only know the final state. So I'm gonna use the word boundary for this. So we can only observe the boundary at the end of this time evolution rather than the time evolution itself. And this has, uh, has profound uh, implications. And so the goal of this talk would be to try to find a way to compute predictions, the one that tells us about the distribution of everything in the universe, from galaxies to photons, from neutrinos to, to, the, to dark matter, uh, without ever invoking things that we don't observe, only talking about the observables themselves, without making up any time-dependent history or any model. And in particular, without using, if some of you are experts, what is known as the in informalism, which is the standard way to, to make predictions in, in this field. Um, this is important, first, because I would be able to make prediction for things that are actually observed. And second is that I would be able to make prediction for those that do not rely on assumptions that I cannot test about the, the time evolution. And so I'm gonna call this approach bootstrap following uh, this, this proposed name in the literature. Um, and I'm gonna, instead of writing down models and solving these models and making prediction, I'm gonna try to only use general principles that we believe are at the core of our understanding of, um, um, of fundamental physics. And so the, I will use the principles of unitarity, locality, symmetrism. I have a uh, question. Like yes. this in informalism we usually use in cosmology, it's a kind of a general, uh, like a specific type of schwinger keldish formalism. Is it so? Uh, exactly. It's actually in some senses very similar to 
uh, the way we learn uh, quantum field theory, uh, when, uh, when we learn quantum field theory in introductory courses, there we learn how to compute uh, amplitudes in which we evolve some initial state into a final state and compute the quantum amplitudes for that. Uh, in the in informalism, you evolve forward in time and then evolve again backward in time. So basically you're only computing the expectation value just as we do in quantum mechanics. And I'm not gonna review very much this formalism because it is good and interesting and it would require a lot of time, but I'm not gonna need it at all, which is a little bit the beauty of this approach. But yes, this formalism would be basically just your interaction picture, uh, time dependent perturbation theory in, in quantum mechanics or, or in quantum field theory. Um, Yes, it's very closely related to the way we compute amplitudes uh, that, that people might be more familiar with from. Uh, yes, yes, from, I know. From, yeah, very good. Yeah, some other question, perhaps. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll try to get a little bit more um, <clears throat> more concrete. Um, and I'll start, so as, as I said, so we're gonna to try to uh, now get everything out of unitarity, locality, symmetries, and a choice of vacuum. So I have to start a little bit discussing what the symmetries are. Here I have one question. Usually yes. like, uh, uh, like once I have started reading about bootstrap, mostly I have started reading regarding this conformal bootstrap. Okay, so there we know that this four point function have this kind of crossing type of symmetries. Uh, for that, you can actually write down this uh, uh, four point function in terms of uh, some conformal blocks. And uh, yeah, so the similar kind of idea here also exists because in this heater space, in exact this heater space, it is basically a uh, like, uh, like, um, yeah, so it's kind of SO, SO 1, 4 theory. Yes, yes. So none of those ideas, although this idea in spirit is similar to those approaches, it would be completely different in all, uh, in all possible uh, details. And the main reason is that uh, we will become clear in a second um, the isometries of the Sitter space time are too many and too strong. And if you know them, uh, the only thing that you could be predicting for the models that we're interested in is basically the free theory. As I'm going to show you in a second, it's too much to rely on the isometries of the sitter space and the conformal symmetry associated with those. Um, it, it's too much. It just leaves no space for anything interesting. Uh, so uh, uh, that's a good introduction to the topic. Indeed, I wanted to discuss symmetry. And so one obvious thing that you can say about symmetry is that as we do in pretty much all introductory cosmology classes, we start saying on large scales, the universe is homogeneous, which means it's, uh, it's invariant under, um, under spatial translations. So three of them is isotropic, so it's invariant under spatial rotations. Uh, and the primordial initial condition also show uh, no evidence for, for a scale. They are scale invariant. Yes. So you can think that there is uh, an additional uh, Sorry, an additional symmetry here, scale invariance. So this will always be assumed because these are measured in the data. And as you mentioned before, it is, um, it is tempting to, uh, to imagine the situation in which there are additional symmetries that help us uh, get to the answer. But as, a large, as I will argue in a second, this is the largest set of symmetries that you can assume. If you assume more than that, that's too much. And the only thing you're going to discuss is the free theory. So let me let me show that how that happens in more detail. So let's discuss symmetries. So let's assume, since we have de detected in the sky that the universe on large scales is homogeneous, isotropic, and scale invariant. And then let's ask the question: How many other space-time symmetries, so symmetries that do not commute with the with these, can I add? And of course, the idea is that the more symmetries you add, usually the easier it is to make predictions. And so you would like to add more symmetries. So I'm gonna prove three theorems, all of them uh, just by uh, talking about observables. 
And these theorems will characterize what symmetries you can add to this problem. So theorem number one will be the definition of what we are interested in. This is what we want to compute. So we don't want to compute general correlators of fields. We don't want to compute expectation values of any field. We want to compute specific expectation value of specific field. And these fields are known in the literature as uh, curvature perturbations and tensor perturbations. And those are the ones that we actually observe in the data. Those are the ones that actually lead to patterns in the cosmic microwave background or galaxies. And I'll argue here that you can define the correlators of those fields based on their sublimits. Uh, the second thing that I'm going to prove is that if you insist that the, the, the correlators that we want to compute are also symmetric under full the sitter uh, isometries, then all of those correlators have to be zero. Meaning the only theory that has full the sitter isometries and is, is the things that we, we measure is the free theory. And so this will motivate me to uh, never use the sitter isometries except for uh, homogeneity, homogeneity isotropy and scaling variance, but never use the sitter boost anywhere else in this approach. Um, and and I'll, I'll give some uh, uh, more clear example of why we need to do that. And this explains, uh, um, yes. There is actually another theorem that, that we proved in that paper, which is some equivalent of Coleman Mandula for cosmology, which is this theorem three. Coleman Mandula for cosmology. But I will not have time to discuss it unless, unless people ask about it. So is that related to the vacuum? To, to the what? The choice of the vacuum. Um, No, no, I don't think it's related to the choice of the vacuum. No, I mean, uh, feel free to ask again, but I think the theorem one and theorem two do not rely on a choice of vacuum. What they do rely is the assumption that uh, we are uh, in a single clock cosmology, meaning there is only one degree of freedom that is responsible for the universe expanding a little bit more or a little bit less. We have, in some sense, evidence in favor of single clock cosmologies because of the adiabatic nature of perturbations in the universe. And this is what, why many people look at single field inflation uh, uh, rather than multi-field. And so theorem one and theorem two will, will also involve this assumption. However, theorem three is general, is valid for any number of fields. And I should specify that all of these theorems, I'll, I'll prove them without writing down a Lagrangian, without assuming a spectrum, and it's going to be valid for uh, fields of any mass, any spin, any number of fields with any interactions. So you will talk about some kind of effective field theory like that. You say kinetic? Effective field theory, EFT approach. No, not really. There's going to be, uh, no, it's going to be different. It's, it's, it's more similar to on-shell methods for amplitude in some sense. Okay. I'm only going to be talking about um, the, the constraints that the result, the correlators have to obey, but I will never be writing down a Lagrangian to compute them. Okay. Otherwise, it would be very hard to prove this theorem in such a generality. Okay. So I'll show you how I will achieve that. So it's perhaps in spirit is similar to the fact that you're doing the sense that it's model independent, but it's definitely a different, uh, a different approach. So let's see how we can achieve to say something without writing down a Lagrangian. So the first step is that we have to define what we are talking about. Uh, so the first thing that we want to observe, well, when you're, when you're doing particle physics, okay, so you, we know what you want to observe it's because you build a collider and you smash particles onto each other. Uh, and then um, you can define what particles go into the collision by defining their quantum numbers. You say what was their momentum, their energy, their spin, maybe they had some charges. And then you can measure how many particles come out and you can tell me what were the quantum numbers of the particles going out. And this procedure defines already uh, as, as scattering amplitudes. Well, I mean, when you do experimentally, you only see the, the norm square of that amplitude. I, and Nicole, I have a question here. Yes. The moment you assume that there is a boundary, are not you already assuming a scale? This is oh yeah, a, a, a excellent question. Yes, I should have specified and maybe I should have written it. 
when I'm talking about boundary, I mean a conformal boundary. So it's actually not located at any finite location, it's located at in, in the infinite future. So the things that I'm gonna compute in this talk, very good question, thank you for giving me the, the opportunity, uh, will be the limit of time going to plus infinity of the expectation value of some operator. Um, so I'm not gonna compute it at any finite time, but at, uh, in, in the far future. So it's, it's a conformal boundary. The mechanical problem, the expectation value does not depend on space, only in time. The expectation value will be equal time, exactly. So equal time. Uh, no, so, even if we take a expectation value of, it's a quantum mechanical operator, it does not have any creation operator or annihilation operator. So uh, I don't worry about equal time now because I have no equal time commutator or anti-commutator relations. So it's a, it's a uh, quantum mechanical operator whose expectation value I will take and you, achieve, you will be assuming that that expectation value is constant from time from minus infinity to plus infinity? Uh, no, it, it can evolve as much as, as you want, but it asymptotes some value in the future. And that's the, thing that can do, the value in the future. I, I will only be computing the limit because when, okay. when we are here, yeah. We do observations, we look in the past, and so we don't know what happens yeah. until we see some galaxies. So the only thing that I care is the asymptotic value in the future. Okay. So you have a future and find uh, and a past, yes. which in generally quantum mechanics we don't do until we come uh, the future light cone or past light cone, which is basically will take not in the Minkowski space time, uh, but uh, Laringian space time. So, but we uh, have a boundary in time somewhere. Uh, and and that a will... boundary, yeah, because. Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, maybe I should have had that. Uh, it should have been, well, I think I have a slide, uh, next, uh, next slide that will explain what I'm computing. Here I was still kind of at the general motivations. Um, okay, okay. Um, so, um, so in cosmology, it would be nice to be able to define what we want to compute. But the usual way to define that is that you write down a Lagrangian and you find the variable that you want to, the, to, to compute. And typically, this curvature perturbation is known as zeta. And then you compute those. But here, we, we didn't want to write down a model. We didn't want to write down a Lagrangian. So how can we even do it? No? And more specifically, the only thing that we ever want to talk about is what we actually measure in the sky, which are expectation value of the product of operators. And so we would like to be talking about the product of uh, fields in the future, and I'm gonna call this field zeta, x and y and z and dot, dot, dot. And there is no time um, argument here because it's all evaluated in the future. But if I, if I hand you one such object, which I'm gonna call a correlator, if I give it to you, this correlator, how do you know that I'm computing the expectation value of, of the field zeta, which is the actual one that I measure in the sky, rather than, than of some other field. In, some other, in other words, what are the right quantum numbers of the object that we want to compute? So if I give you a, 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 a zeta, you can imagine that you can redefine it, and perhaps you're giving me the correlator of this field redefinition of zeta than, rather than zeta itself. So I have to tell you which one I actually want, because when, when you look in the sky, you only measure one of them. You measure this one and not this one. So we would want this one and we don't want that. So how, how do you do? Uh, well, theorem one is what answers these questions. So theorem one says that uh, the thing that we want to compute are these expectation values, which I have written here, meaning they are just quantum mechanical expectation value of the product of operator. Mostly we will be working in Fourier space. So the argument will be things like Q and K and K prime. These are three dimensional uh, special moments. Yes, that this squeezed it 
for squeeze state, this three point you have written, I think. So uh, this is the object we want to compute. And here I'm saying that the specific one that we are interested in to compute is the one that has the property that as uh, Q goes to zero, as yeah. they take one of the three momenta to zero, that's a soft limit, it obeys a very specific relation. This relation uh, is a consequence of um, just uh, gravity, diffeomorphism invariance. And this uniquely defines the variable that we want to compute. These relations are called uh, soft theorems. And you can think of those as being uh, the soft theorems no, so those are the objects. That's why, that's why I told this is actually earlier people used to call it squeeze triangle limit. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is what they call the well, this this limit is the squeeze limit. And the yeah. fact that in the squeeze limit it had to obey this relation was first pointed out by Maldacena and then generalized in a series of many papers to pretty much all orders and all possible fields. But the simplest relation says that the three point function in the limit in which one of the three momenta goes to zero reduces to a two-point function where p is the is the power spectrum so the two-point function square uh, times a specific number which is the tilt of the power spectrum and then corrections to that only arise at next to next to leading order in q where q is the momentum that is going to, is going to zero and so the claim is that if i give you an object that uh, an expectation value that satisfies this property, that object is the, the expectation value of the product of, uh, of zetas, which are exactly the, the quantities that we measure in the sky. So the things that we want to compute, they all have to obey this relation as well as all the infinitely many generalization to, to higher order, which I have not written down. So that's the thing that you have to tell uh, uh, observers to measure. Um, this is true in single uh, clock inflation, uh, which is the, the simplest model that, that we have so far, which is fully compatible with everything we have ever observed. In fact, it gives a remarkable explanation for the, uh, for the adiabaticity of perturbations in our universe. Um, Good. So, how how can I think of this uh, of the soft theorems? Well, there is a simpler way to think about them, and you think of them as being the consequences of a set of symmetries. So, as we know, when you have symmetries acting on the operators in your theory, then if they are linearly realized, they give you simple relation on the correlation functions. If they are non-linearly realized, then they give you soft theorems, which is exactly what happens here. So, this and all the infinitely many other soft theorems. They simply follow from the existence of these two symmetries. The symmetries, you can think of them, I call them D, nonlinear. This NL is just to remind us that this acts nonlinearly in the field, and K and L. And so if you had something which is uh, the, the symmetry responsible for scale invariance are dilations. And so when they act on, on, on zeta, they act simply as a, as a dilation operator at future infinity. And so if you have a correlator that is invariant under this, since it's invariant under dilation, it cannot have any scale. And that's exactly what we observe in the power spectrum. The power spectrum is a scale invariance. So as a consequence of this, things like the power spectrum has to go like one over K cube, which is indeed what we observe. So, so we are happy about that symmetry. However, since also the soft theorems are true, you need to have additional symmetries. And let's look at the first one. You can think of uh, the first one that I call D nonlinear to be a nonlinear version of scaling. So it's not the same thing, it's an independent symmetry, but it looks the same because the second term is just the same, is also a dilation, but it also comes with a shift. Um, and then there is another symmetry that has two linear terms, which is this last two. These linear terms um, look like uh, a De Sitter boost, or if you want, um, just a Lorentz boost on short distances. But it also comes with a shift that looks like a Galilean shift. So the claim that it doesn't matter what the details are, but the claim is that if you have these two symmetries, they imply all of these consistency relations. And so the object that we want to compute should be 
symmetric under these two generators, actually all the three of them. This one is just scale invariance. And so what I'm gonna prove here is that if you have an object that is symmetric under these, that has precisely this transformation, that object, it, it, this transformation uniquely defined that object. There is no other object that can have this same transformation unless the object itself. And so the proof, well, I mean, the details are in the paper, but the sketch of the proof is pretty simple. Suppose that you wanna uh, redefine this zeta into some other zeta, zeta twiddle, that is different from zeta. You can write down the most generic redefinition. You can try to say, well, it's zeta plus some arbitrary function of zeta, maybe an arbitrary function of derivative of zeta, or an arbitrary function of inverse Laplacians and derivative of zeta. Uh, but uh, you can, it's easy to show that if you, if f was any function that is not zero, then this transformation would not be maintained. So zeta twiddle would have a different transformation from this one. So if I insist that this is the correct transformation, then the only function that I can write here is zero. So I cannot put any function. And the same works for field redefinition with derivatives. If I use both D nonlinear and D, I cannot do any of them. And finally, if I also use this K nonlinear, which is also necessarily to define the variable I'm interested in, I can also do, I cannot, I also cannot do any field redefinition with inverse Laplacian. So in summary, what this theorem proves is that if I, a given correlator is a correlator of zeta, which is what we want to compute in cosmology, if and only if it obeys all of these uh, single clock soft theorems. So this defines in some sense what it is that we want to compute. Uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you now. Can you please go back to your yeah. previous slide? Yeah. So how is, what is the metric used here to define X square? Uh, so you can see that if I define zeta squared? Zeta square or X square, which is XI, XI. What is the, what metric has been used here? Is it Euclidean metric, ordinary delta IJ metric? Yes. Yeah, just delta IJ. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Just the delta IJ. Uh, why should the why should the perturbations respect Euclidean in space time? Uh, very good question. It so happens that the existence of these two symmetries is a consequence is a consequence of large diffeomorphisms. So if you insist in thinking about this from bulk perspective by writing down a model with a Lagrangian and you just write down the, um, for example, the Einstein-Hilbert term plus a scalar field with some derivatives. Well, that theory has diff invariance, famously, at the core of, of uh, uh, general relativity. And there are various types of diffeomorphisms and on FLRW space times, any FLRW space time, not just the sitter, you can look at diffeomorphism that vanish a special infinity or the different reasons that do not vanish. Mm. If you look at those that do not vanish, there are two of them yeah. that correspond to these transformations. So as long as the theory is diff invariant, these need to be symmetries of the, of the theory. I see, okay. okay. My other question is that for the nonlinear that what to say Bush type, why are we stopping at X square? Suppose I add another term X fourth, then all the thing we are discussing X fourth delta I zeta, then will that be a symmetry or will that be all the discussion will make that is also goes through? Why am I stopping at order X square? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So maybe to get more intuition on that question, let me write down. If you were to write down a metric, G yeah. menu, yeah. then this variable zeta would be the trace of the metric, of the perturbations of the metric. So let's say that you write down a metric and you, we, we expand it in a, a background metric, which is, uh, I don't know, FLRW, for example, and there are um, yeah. perturbations. Then my claim is that zeta is just the trace of these perturbations, of the spatial part of the perturbation. 
So this zeta is actually just one component, one specific component of the metric. Very good. So what we know is that in a theory uh, of, of gravity, because of different variance, the metric itself is not observable. You cannot tell me what is the value of G00 because you can change coordinate and that changes. The only thing that is actually physical is R mu nu rho sigma, which is the Riemann tensor. And you can yeah. think of the Riemann tensor basically as being two derivatives acting on the metric. Okay. And so the fact that it's two derivatives rather than seven derivatives tells you that as long as you do transformation that have two powers of X, uh, you have some hopes that Riemann doesn't change. And so you have just changed coordinates. But if you put too many powers of X, they're gonna change Riemann. And so that's not gonna be a symmetry. This is of course just very hand wavy. You actually have to do a calculation, but this is, tells you why it stops at two. Okay, okay. So Enrico, let me just tell you, introduce myself. My name is Sudhakar Panda. I remember those days when you were working about uh, inflection point, inflation, inflation yes. around inflection. Yeah, so we had some overlap of interest at that time. So uh, uh, my name is Sudhakar Panda. You have put it my paper sometimes and uh, I just introduced myself now. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah, I remember it was on the yeah, string theory yeah. models of inflation yes, yes, yes. back in the day. Yes, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, so now that we have decided what we are going to compute, the thing that we want to compute and give to our friends, the observers, are correlators of the product of this field, either in Fourier space or in real space, it doesn't matter. We can do the Fourier transform. But we want to compute only those that obey those soft theorems so that this uniquely defines them. Now we can ask the question, how many symmetry can we have? And recall that we have already said that we want to have homogeneity, isotropy, and scale invariance because we measure those in the data. And so we need to, it seems reasonable that if we want to reproduce the data, we assume those symmetries. But you can ask, well, wait a second, let's try to put more symmetries. Why not? More symmetries better, it's going to make it easier. And in fact, people over the years, uh, actually very many uh, groups and collaborations, uh, have uh, noticed that if you use the full Decitter isometries, you can compute uh, many, uh, many correlators um, much more easily using the symmetries themselves because they restrict the possible form of the answer uh, so strongly. Uh, and this has been done starting already maybe 15 years ago, Maldacena Pimentel computed the three-point function for gravitons, and then very many other people have computed that three-point function involving scalars. And most recently there has been perhaps a more systematic approach on how to proceed with that. Uh, so the key idea here is let's use the full Decitter isometry. And just to remind you, the full Decitter isometry is, uh, is um, the group is uh, S O, um, what is it? Is it SO3, 2? So SO4, 1. No, it is SO4, 1. Um, and so this consists of. It's 4, 1. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, three rotations three translations, uh, three boosts, and one dilation. So as we said before, the dilation is what gives us scale invariance, so we want to keep it. Translation and rotation, we want to keep them. But boosts, should we add them or not? Uh, here I'm going to prove that if you add boosts, you kill all possible correlators, and the only correlators that survive are all zero. In fact, we kind of know if some of you have done some phenomenology uh, of, of primordial non Gaussianity, you probably know that you can produce uh, primordial non Gaussianity is just a name that people give to this endpoint correlators for n bigger or equal to three. So anything that goes beyond the power spectrum is sometimes called non Gaussianity, but it's just another name for, for non vanishing correlators. And so to get the three point function to be large, uh, people know that you have to have fields that move at the speed of sound much smaller than one. And that clearly is something that breaks uh, boosts for the simple reason that 
you can imagine already in, um, in Minkowski that what boosts do is that they move you uh, on a parabola in let's say the future light cone. So if, if you move at a speed which is less than the speed of light, you move on the sound cone, but the sound cone clearly is not gonna be invariant under boost. If you boost, you move the sound cone to the left or to the right. So if you have a speed of sound which is different from one, you break boosts. And in fact, the only models that are known that produce large non gaussianity in single field inflation and are also scale invariant are models in which the speed of sound is smaller than one. This suggests that if you wanna get something interesting, you have to break boosts, meaning you cannot use the Sitter isometries to compute it. So here we are promoting this simple observations to actually a theorem that is valid to all orders for any possible interaction for any possible field, number of fields of any mass and any spin. And, and the proof is relatively simple, naturally at least. Can I ask a question? Sorry, it's still on the yes. previous part before you go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to ask you, but so this fixing of the ambiguity on field rate definitions, this is proven for scalars or? The, here we only prove it for scalars, exactly. And I'm not only gonna compute scalars. What I'm saying that you can have any fields of any mass and spin are the one of which I'm not computing the correlator. Meaning as long as you compute the correlator of zeta, it's okay if, the interaction between two zeta is mediated by a spin 32 massive field. That's okay. The theorem still goes through, but the theorem doesn't say anything if that spin 32 field appears in the correlator. So that I don't know how to compute, but if it is a mediator, if it is an internal line, this theorem. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I just want, I want if we if we know if you know for example like then how i mean are there constraints what do do we expect this field definitions instead uh, in case of spin particles with spin what would they do i mean i understand this is not fixed we we don't understand how uh, we don't understand this higher spin correlator correlators in general but what I'm, so perhaps I didn't understand the question. So everything I'm saying is only going to describe the product of, uh, of zetas. Huh? And everything I'm going to say will be true irrespectively of the presence of higher spin particles or other particles and irrespectively of their mass, as long as it is a single clock inflation. So I'm not going to assume anything about that. I will not need to. So if you now, if you want to see in the proof, uh, uh, the proof will go through without any assumption of whether there are other masses there or not, or other particles of any mass. Is that what you're asking or maybe something different? No, I was simply asking, um, I was asking on the correlators that I understand you were to focus on this, on correlators and scalars, but uh, for example, in these papers, you just mentioned there is a discussion of, you know, what if instead we have correlators of spin and particles with spin. And in that case, I understand there is oh. ambiguity of definitions. And I wanted to ask you if you com could comment on that, like do how do we expect to see this or what kind of, what would change in the correlator if we redefine the field, for example, is this known in any way? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. And unfortunately I do not know the answer. So the question is, uh, are there any field redefinitions in this case. I don't think I know the answer to that. I mean, six months ago, I would have said, yeah, probably, because we haven't proven that there aren't, so probably there are. However, um, I wasn't able to find field redefinition for the transverse traceless part of the graviton. So I've recently started suspecting that maybe there aren't any. And perhaps this has a natural holographic interpretation in terms of a putative uh, dual CFT in, uh, um, in the renormalization of uh, contact correlators in the CFT where the energy momentum tensors collide with itself. Uh, so I think the short answer is that I don't know, but I, I'm actually not sure that there are problems even for gravitons, although we haven't proven it. It seems to me that there might be no problem there as well. You might be able to prove it also for gravitons that there are no field redefinitions. Perhaps another way of saying it is that 
if you look at Maldacena's calculation, and I don't know, the three point function for graviton or graviton scalar scalar or graviton graviton scalar, uh, there are a bunch of scalar field redefinition that contribute to those three point functions. But there is never a graviton redefinition. It's always the scalar being redefined, I think. So I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, further about it. I mean, it's not a published thing. I'm just uh, telling you a speculation. I suspect that uh, after all this might not be a problem in general. But no, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you define, uh, oh God, how do you, uh, yes, I don't know, maybe this, this is not really in the, the topic here, but how can you redefine this? Let's say that you want to redefine it into gamma ij plus, I don't know, zeta gamma ij. This would be an attempt of a redefinition. The problem is that this new term is not uh, transverse. If you take the derivative, this is not zero. So it's not, you cannot do it because it has to be transverse. This one, when we say gamma, we mean the transverse traceless part of the metric. So you cannot do that. And so, uh, so I wasn't able to write anything down that is transverse and traceless. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to chat more about it if you have, uh, this is perhaps a bit tangential to what we're discussing here. Uh, yes, please um, go ahead with your talk. I didn't want to make a big interruption, but yeah. Are there some other questions? No, in that case, so I'm going to prove something. What I'm going to prove, well, mathematically is a simple statement. I'm going to prove that if you insist in working in the sitter and computing the correlator of zeta, then those correlators need to be invariant under all of these symmetries. This is the full, uh, this is a set of symmetries that you need. It's translations, rotations, dilations. If you, work, if you insist working in the sitter, then you're also saying, oh, I also have the, the sitter boosts. Uh, and then, as I prove, uh, as I proved before, you, the, the soft theorems you need to have them in single field. You need this in single field. You need these guys, and so you need to have all of the symmetries. And then you go and compute something that is invariant under all of the symmetries. What I'm going to prove to you now is that the only objects, the only correlators that are invariant under all of the symmetries, are the correlators of the free theory. They're all zero. And the problem is boost. The reason is that because you added boost. If you take away boost, then it's fine. But if you insist in having boosts, so you are working in the sitter, then there is nothing that you have to compute. It's only the free theory that is invariant. Um, strictly speaking here, I'm going to use dilations to be an exact symmetries or this scale invariance to be exact. And you might ask, well, what happens if it is broken by slow roll corrections? Well, then what I'm going to say will have small slow roll corrections. So my statement will admit a small slow roll correction. So if you want another way of saying this theorem is that if you have small slow roll corrections, then non gaussianity have to be small if you use the sitter resonance. Uh, and the proof is relatively conceptually very simple. It just says, okay, well, we have an algebra of, um, of symmetries. Symmetries form an algebra because if you take two symmetries and combine them, you get another symmetry. And we combine symmetries by taking uh, the commutators. Uh, but then if you combine that new symmetry with another symmetry, you create a new symmetry and you keep on going. And here you can prove that actually the algebra is infinite dimensional. So to see this, uh, consider that this particular generator, this particular symmetry, which is a boost minus its nonlinear version. What this thing does, it, it, it's very simple. It just takes zeta and sends it into zeta plus xi. It actually acts like a Galilean transformation, if some of you is familiar with that. Okay, so let's then, then we need to have this symmetry because it's a linear combination of two symmetries we already had. But then let me call this new symmetry V. But then let me take the commutator of V with a boost. You can just compute it, it's a commutator. And it gives you a, a shift by X squared. So you say, oh, well, now I have another symmetry. I can also shift it by X squared, X, I, X, G. But then you commute this with K again and you get a shift by X cube. So yeah, okay, well, let's put the other one. XL, XM, XN. And it's easily to convince yourself, and there is a formal proof based just on conformal weight, that this thing will never end. 
and you're going to find that zeta is invariant under the shift of an, any polynomial of any order. And it's perhaps already intuitive that there's going to be no theory that is invariant under that unless all correlators are zero. It's just too much symmetry. And we give a formal proof of that using the operator product expansion. And we say, well, this is the operator product expansion of some hypothetical theory that you have. And we want to know what is the OPE of the product of two fields at two different points as these two points are taken to be closer and closer to each other. And from that, we subtract what we would get if the theory was free. If the theory was free, this, this operator product expansion would just be the Taylor expansion of a field. Uh, and the other is just evaluating. So here, I think I've assumed that y is zero. So I should have written, uh, I've assumed that y is zero. Here, I should have written zero. Sorry about that. Uh, OK, so what's left is what we, we would call interactions. If there is any other terms in the OPE that are not these, then you say the theory is interacting. Um, and now what you do is that you take all the infinitely many symmetries that we have found here, and you apply them to the left-hand side, meaning you do, um, uh, you apply them to the left-hand side, all of these symmetries, Vn, and you can prove very easily that it always gives zero. But if it gives zero to the left-hand side, it also has to give zero when you do it to the right-hand side. It's also to be zero. And uh, what that does is that it imposes uh, that all of these free coefficients, they all have to vanish. And so the theory cannot have any interaction in that sense is, is free. The OPE is the OPE of a free theory. So what this proves is that uh, if you really care about cosmology, single field cosmology and making prediction for correlators of zeta, and you wanna get something that is not zero, you cannot use the Sitter isometries in single clock cosmology, which, which, which I stress. If you are in multi-field models, then th those methods are still useful because the soft theorems that I used before do not apply. Uh, it is true that in realistic models, dilations and boosts are approximate symmetry, so they're slightly broken. So it is possible that you work in quasi the center and you get non gaussianity that are small of order slow row but you cannot never get something which is of order one or of order 10. You're always going to get something which is neural suppressed. Um, and the last thing that I want to mention is that this is not, does not apply to multi-field models. So, so the Sitter isometry might be useful in, in those cases. So, the, 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 so at the end, because of this theorem two, we're only going to be interested in a boost less approach. So we will never gonna we never gonna want to use boosts as symmetries in our problem, and hence the title of, of this talk, the boostless bootstrap. Um, very good. So now I'm gonna show you how you can actually make progress without ever mentioning boosts or invariant under boosts. Um, but sorry, Enrico, just to interrupt. Do yes, yes, please. Do we are Boostless. I feel in other words, we are simply saying that when car symmetry is broken. Uh, no, right? sorry, sorry, just to be clear, this is, is spontaneously broken. It's spontaneously okay. broken. Okay. And, and that's also the case in cosmology uh, because yeah. in, in cosmology, in fact, this is something which is in some senses extremely obvious. And yet, when I, when I understood it, it, it was. Surprisingly surprising. So what, what do we say in the first lecture of, of a cosmology class? The first thing we say, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Absolutely, absolutely. And you might ask the question, wait, homogeneous and isotropic in which reference frame? If yes. it is homogeneous and isotropic in one reference frame and you jump on a train, it's not gonna be homogeneous and isotropic because you see stuff coming at you. Yeah. Um, in fact, when we say that the CNB is isotropic, Actually, it is not. When you take a picture, even, uh, uh, even if you neglect the, the, the small 10 to the minus 5 anisotropies, yeah. the CM does not look isotropic because there is a very large dipole. The dipole has to do with the fact that the Earth is moving against uh, uh, the rest frame of the CMB. And so you see this large Doppler effect. Yes. So that is, is like in your face to show you that boosts are always broken in cosmology all the time. 
and it doesn't really make much sense to invoke them. They're just always not the symmetries. Spontaneously, of course, spontaneously. Yeah, spontaneously, then uh, it's a local symmetry. We have some local symmetry is spontaneously broken. Yeah. Uh, then I will expect some goldstone modes to come out of your th this theory. Do you see any goldstone modes in your theories? No, I see. Yeah, goldstone theorem applies only to internal symmetries and not to space-time symmetries. Okay, that's, so you don't need okay, to. that's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, famously, when you break space-time symmetries, you can get less goldstones than the number of generators that are broken. Yes, yeah. In fact, this is an interesting subject of whether you can ever observe the goldstone bosons of boosts. And uh, yeah. there is an interesting story that has to do with the zoology of condensed matter papers. And I think the answer is that we never observe the goldstone bosons of boosts in physics. And uh, there might be a good reason for that, but that would be a different talk. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. It's a good, uh, it's a good question. It's important. So that says a, a really. Boost. So it's not that I'm invoking violation of Lorentz invariance. I'm just saying there is something that fills the universe, and so that the presence of that breaks boosts. And this is true in any model of inflation or of cosmology that you will ever write down. No. Very good. And anything else? No, go ahead. Yeah, no, some, someone else perhaps. If not, what we're going to do now, and we're going to try to actually compute something. So far, we have only said which symmetries can we use and which symmetry can we not use. And now we're going to try to compute something. And the main idea is that we're going to use our notion of, uh, our, uh, of amplitudes which is something which is much easier to compute. Uh, ampli, see it's hard to spell on a tablet. Amplitudes. And I'm gonna use amplitudes to bootstrap correlators. So I'm gonna use amplitudes which are much simpler to compute something which is more complicated, which is what we want. And in this <clears throat> example, I'm only gonna focus on three point functions. So, x, um, y, and z stuff. Uh, but then in the last part of this, uh, of this lecture, I'll show you how to do it for uh, generic endpoint functions. But the, the simplest thing is that you start with three-point functions. And so I'm going to show you how to do it. So as we said before, we could start using the Sidera isometries. And you have a lot of symmetries and very powerful. But alas, you, you don't get any, anything large anything that would be very interesting for, uh, unless you go to more complicated models. So we're gonna proceed without invoking ever boost. Um, so the, what is the idea? So we don't wanna write down a Lagrangian or an effective theory Lagrangian and compute something. We're gonna understand how the fundamental principles of, of physics, like locality, symmetries, and unitarity, constrains the object that we are computing. And the object we are computing are this boundary correlator. So we're gonna find some rules that tell us, okay, if you have unitarity, then this. If you have locality, then this. If you have symmetry, then this. And we wanna apply all of those rules. And what comes out is the most generic correlator that you can get compatible with those rules. Okay, so I'm gonna call those rules bootstrap rules, but in some sense, they're kind of fundamental physics rules. Uh, and I'm gonna use three things, well, four things, symmetries, unitarity, locality, and a choice of vacuum. Um, and I'm going to be able to compute, actually, I think these rules uh, give you all possible by spectra for massless scalars and gravitons, although I'm only going to show you some of them in this talk. Uh, and so here are the rules. The first rules, well, it's about symmetries. We said, well, these are the simple one. The universe is homogeneous, isotropic, um, uh, homogeneous, isotropic, and scale invariant. So our result has to be invariant under rotation, translations, and dilations. And then the next thing is going to tell us that we're working at three level. I'm going to be able to compute this object only at three level. I think there is hope to, to say something about loops, but that will come in the last part of the talk. But so far, I'm going to proceed at three level. And then this is going to be the most powerful fact. I'm going to use a particular limit of correlators in which they reduce to just flat space amplitudes, which are objects that are much easier to compute and for which I already know many results. 
ट्री I am failing to understand what is a graviton. Yeah, yeah, there will be gravitons. This is going to be a theory of gravity. When I say that I abandon boost, I'm just saying that uh, like something like you, me, or this table breaks boost spontaneously. So we should then we can use them not linearly, but not linearly. So that's that's what I mean. But yes, okay. I'm going to correlators of gravitons. Okay. I'm going to compute the usual thing: just correlators of gravitons with scalars, and scalars with scalars, and gravitons with gravitons. I'm going to reproduce all of uh, Maldacena's results in uh, what I think is a simpler derivation. In fact, the graviton, graviton, graviton by spectrum would be half, half a page. Okay, okay, go ahead, let's see, yeah. And then at some point it's important that we say the theory is local, so that, that will, will impose a, a certain constraint. And also that we want to say that the universe started out in some state. If you don't tell me the initial state of the universe, uh, I cannot predict. And so we will make the standard choice, which is the bunch Davis vacuum, or if you want the Hartle-Hawking vacuum, the, the one that corresponds to Minkowski when you're at very short distances where the, the horizon doesn't matter. And finally, I will impose the soft limit, which, which is what we discussed just now. So let me discuss these rules a little bit more in detail. So we're trying to compute this object, which is, remember, this is the expectation value of X at with momentum. Sorry, it keeps it keeps keeps doing this. Uh, X with expect uh, X of uh, some helicity h1 and momentum k1, y of helicity h2 and momentum k2 and z of helicity h3 and momentum k3. This is the thing we want to compute, and I'm gonna call it b, so I don't have to write this whole thing every time. If you want, this would be b of x, y, z. But sometimes I will not write X, Y, Z, it's just the bispectrum. And so this bispectrum, well, just by the fact that here there are particles and it's going to be only all massless particles. So I'm going to only compute for massless scalars like zeta and for massless spin two like the graviton. Uh, and so these particles will come with their own polarization. Actually, these rules, I think they're valid for any particles of any spin, but I'm mostly going to care about spin two and spin zero. So they come with their polarization tensor, which is going to be symmetric and transverse traceless. I'm not writing down all of the indices of the polarization tensors to keep this formula simpler, but all of the indices should be contracted in a rotation invariant way with themselves or with momentum. And then there is something which is left out that doesn't depend on the polarizations. So I'm going to give names to this. The first thing I'm going to call it the polarization factor. And the second one, I'm going to call it the trimmed by spectrum. So this is the full bispectrum and this is the trimmed bispectrum. It's trimmed because we cut out the, the polarization factor. And this object has to be scale invariant, meaning that if you rescale all of the momenta, it has a fixed scaling, which is the usual one if you're familiar with inflation, it goes like one over k to the six. But if you have additional powers of k here, you have to subtract it off. So this is just scale invariant. So not much, not much has happened so far. Some questions on this? What is alpha here? Uh, sorry, alpha is just a number, some integer. For example, I'll do an example uh, for the uh, for the graviton scalar scalar. The graviton of the ECD H. This object will be epsilon H I J. K i k j. So alpha in this case would be alpha one would be one and alpha two would be two. Okay. So I'm just uh, the same thing that you would do for uh, you would write for an amplitude. And uh, sorry, what do they accept? How do you define the curly beta, the trimmed by spectrum? 
Can you say it again? What about the trimmed by spectrum? Yeah, the trimmed by spectrum, the curly beta, uh, what has gone into that? That can be just a bounce damage backup. Well, I mean, the, the, the rest of the talk will be about telling you what, what that is. So I'm going to show you how to compute it. So far, I'm just telling you some object which contains everything else. Um, all the, yes, all the integrals from the mode functions will go here, probably. If you want to think about it in terms of the calculation. Although, so far, I don't have to say it. So far, you just take all of the polarization and you put them in front. And everything left, you just call it beta. And this is a well-defined procedure. Beta is, is a scalar. It's the only scalar that you can remove out of here. So I think it's uniquely defined by the way I'm writing it. Okay. So now rule number two gets a little bit interesting. Rule number two says that this beta at three level in the C term, so, which is basically what we are interested in when we are uh, doing cosmology because we cannot do non-perturbative calculations and loops are, are, are tiny uh, uh, um, in these models. Uh, so we are interested in three level. Then this B is not an arbitrary function of the norm of the momenta. So, so now we are computing a three point function. So by momentum conservation, a three point function is defined by three momenta, which I can call K1, K2, and K3, and by momentum conservation, the sum of them has to be zero. So they close to form a triangle. And if, if you give you the length of the size of a triangle, the length K1, the length of K2, and the length of K3, then the triangle is completely defined. So this B should be just a function of K1, K2, K3 without the vector on top. And I'm saying that this function is not any function, it's a very specific function, it's a rational function. This is what makes it extremely easy. So when you do the calculation, well, you always see that it is a rational function. And here I'm saying that on the boundary, the equivalent of working at three level is restricting to rational functions. Okay. So there's only one exception, which is the presence of logs. And I'll discuss that uh, when they arise. But in general, just a rational function. And notice that the order of this, uh, rich, of this so the order of these polynomials are such that that beta is scale invariant. So, so you only have, there is beta that you don't know, but everything else is fixed. So you just have to write down two polynomials and then that's the solution. Now we're gonna use a very powerful result, which is our rule number three is the amplitude limit. Uh, so it was noted uh, a while ago by, by Raju, uh, Maldasen and Pimentel that a particular limit of correlator reduces to the flat space amplitude. More recently, uh, we, we derive an, an, an ex a more explicit expression with, with a proof, but it's, it's the same statement. And it says that if you take uh, a particular variable, which is the sum of the norm of the momenta, k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus kn, without the vector, this is the sum of the lengths. Well, in general, if k are real, that this thing is always positive. But if you allow for the, to analytically extend this function, uh, then these things can be negative. And you can ask what happens when this kt, this k total, which I'm gonna call the total energy, what happens when that goes to zero? And what was proven following uh, these observations uh, is that when you take kt to zero, b, the, the, the correlator, reduces to the amplitude a times a bunch of factors. And there are a bunch of numerical factors in front that don't matter very much. But the thing that matters is uh, it comes with certain scaling with K. So if you know the amplitude, then this limit of the correlator is completely fixed with all the numbers, the factors of minus one and two and eight. So the only parameter here, H is the Hubble parameter. Sorry? It's, it's for any endpoint amplitude. Yes. And this proof is at three level, but we also have a, a relation which is valid at loop at the level of integrands. But for the moment, let's talk about three level. This is valid for any um, any amplitude for fields uh, for any number of fields with any spin. Okay. P is an integer here. P exactly. So let me discuss. So the only parameter that appears here is the uh, P. 
So this is an integer, and that integer can be derived, and I derive it in this recent paper, uh, just based on dimensional analysis and scale invariance. And you can think that it is one plus the sum over all vertices that contribute to this correlator of the uh, dimension. This is the mass dimension of the interaction. And it is always positive or zero? Or um, negative. It's non negative. It's, it can be zero, exactly. It's non negative. Non negative, okay. Okay. For example, I don't know if you have a diagram. Uh, oops. If you have a diagram uh, that looks like. A diagram like this, there are three interactions and yeah. they are generated by operators of dimension D1, D2, D3. Then you do one plus D1 minus four plus D2 minus four plus D3 minus four, you get a number. And uh, lo and behold, if you do the calculation, that's gonna be exactly this exponent. Oh. Uh, so this is an extremely powerful relation. Uh, in particular, if we're looking at the three point function, P is nothing but the number of derivatives in the interaction. So okay. P is very, very, very simple if you're doing a three point function. But the only thing that we're looking at is a three point function. And then you consider an operator that has a certain number of derivatives, uh, phi, and you spread those derivatives however you want, then uh, the number of derivatives is going to be the same as this p. Okay. Good. So this is powerful. It tells you that basically what you would call the effective field theory expansion in operators that have more and more derivatives actually is just an expansion in uh, in this, uh, in this uh, number of factors of KT, which is nice. So now we have a pure boundary way of thinking about what effective field theories are without writing down Lagrangians and stuff. Can I ask a question? So, sorry. Yes. Uh, so just to understand, this AN is the amplitude in the flat, uh, in the, in the flat space limit, right? AN in is amplitude in the flat space limit. Huh? Okay. You would like to call it the Minkowski amplitude, huh? although it does not need to obey all of the constraints that an amplitude in Minkowski would have to obey. But yes, it would be the amplitude that you would obtain if you use um, the same uh, Lagrangian in flat space. Oh, okay. Uh, if you want to work with a Lagrangian. From this point of view, you have to tell me what interactions you put in. So what, amplit what those interactions would do in flat space. Huh? And I'm going to tell you how to what they do in the system. So the amplitude in this, from this approach is an input. And this is good because we know how to describe amplitude using this pure on-shell methods. So in principle, if you want to write down the most generic correlator, you have to write down the most generic amplitude there. And then and then work out. I'm gonna give you some examples here. Very good. Some other questions? But this is this is true only for the three level, or it's true also for loop level? This expression is only true at three level. We have a similar expression for loops, but then it works at the level of the integrand. Then it is the integrand of the correlator and the integrand of the amplitude that are related. But as I've written it here, it's only valid at three level, but for any number of legs. If you want the expression at one loop, we, we wrote it in the paper for the integrand of the loop. Okay, thanks. Very good. Question. Is this related to the choice of a vacuum? Like if you didn't pick one series vacuum, would you find the amplitude uh, on some other singularity, like in some, somewhere else? Yeah, I think this particular expression is related to choosing the bunch Davis vacuum. I think you can find a similar expression that is valid for another vacuum. But this, this one, I think, does assume it. I'm not mistaken, but I think it does. 
So if you tell me, if you tell me, no, actually my vacuum is this specific Bogolyubov transformation of Bunch Davis, then I think I can derive a similar expression using the same technique as we did in this paper to find a similar expression that looks more or less like this, but the coefficient might be different. Um, yes, so I, I think that would be possible to derive, but we haven't done so. But you think only the coefficients or probably also this, this would be k total in denominator, would be some other combination. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely it's not going to be k total. It's going to be, uh, you, you would expect this, um, how shall we call them, uh, this folded uh, singularity configurations in which uh, instead of summing all the energy with a plus, uh, this, these guys become minuses. So let's say k1 minus k2 plus k3 is the type of singularity that you expect when you have uh, deviations from bunch Davis, which then you would give you singularity instead of when KT is zero, when this combination is zero, which actually does happen for uh, physical configurations that are known as folded singularities. Um, so actually you're right. So perhaps one could derive uh, a similar relation of what would happen yeah, that's a good question. We have not derived it. So that's something interesting to, to do. Uh, of course, in doing that, you need to tell me what the vacuum is. For example, it could be like a specific uh, Google of transformation of bunch Davis. And then I think you would get an expression like this that depends on the alphas and betas of that uh, Google of transformation. But if you say nothing about what the vacuum is, it's like an arbitrary wave function, then I don't think you can get anything interesting. Because uh, you know you know what what a dog is, but you don't know what a known dog is. So you have to tell me what is known much Davis, but what is it? You have to tell me a little bit more. But I think that if you limit yes. the volume of rotation, this would be you will be able to do the calculation. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Probably worth doing it. Um, some other questions. If not, I'm going to move to, I mean, now in a second, I'm going to show you how to use all of these rules. So maybe this is a bit boring to see just the rules, but I want to go through the rules and then I show you how to use them in a concrete example. So now this rules is actually pretty straightforward. It's just, it says that as long as we compute correlators of bosons, like spin zero and spin two, um, and then if you're using like the same field three times, for example, like the scalar, scalar, scalar correlator or the graviton, 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 then of course the result has to be symmetric under permutations. And this is a very useful observation in practice because um, since B at three level is just a rational function, is, is, is uh, the ratio between two polynomials. And there is an interesting theorem that says that uh, there is a unique way to write a polynomial that is symmetric under permutation uh, in terms of a, sp a special set of variables, which are called elementary symmetric polynomials. And I'm gonna use these variables throughout. They're actually very simple, but it's worth remembering them. And so if you don't remember them, maybe I'll write them once again later on. All I can say is that they use and throw some of the symmetries, like they're free or just symmetry. I can write down an effective field of derivative if you want to understand the little part. I'm sorry, I, the connection is too bad. I cannot really hear. Maybe someone else can help me. I, I cannot hear very well. Maybe if you go closer to the mic. No, I'm mean, just uh, getting worried is that suppose I want to write down an effective theory where I don't have effective theory of gravity, where I don't have the boost symmetries. I will end up somewhere uh, which is neither Newtonian gravity nor Einstein gravity or Poincare gravity. No, no, no. I think there is a misunderstanding here. This is just standard gravity. I'm just doing this. Boosts are spontaneously broken. So this is just the effective theory of inflation. Gravity is just the standard good old gravity. It's just gravity plus a scalar field. So the breaking is spontaneous. It means that the, the theory has a current, uh, the current is still conserved. Uh, there Do is you understand that spontaneous symmetry breaking here? 
details about the spontaneous symmetry breaking of boost symmetry i have not used it yet so, okay. so far i have not used it yes but uh, in principle one should use it but i will be able to actually compute the bias spectrum without using it uh, although you might ask what would happen if you imposed it, and that's something we're working on, but I will not impose the nonlinear realization of boosts. Uh, okay. I think that I know how to impose it. I think it should be given by subleading soft theorems. Uh, yes, and I, I think there is a paper of Kouri that probably explains how that happens to some extent. But uh, we are still working on it. Okay. Okay. Good. Go ahead. It's a good question. Um, so, so far, I think in all the examples I'll present, you will see I will not need that. Okay. But maybe when you go to higher point functions, like the four point function, that. Yes. That is yes, yes, yes. Because the moment you say there is a scale invariance, four point functions do exhibit some extra symmetry, which may not be in the Lagrangian, but spectrum will show that. So when you want to discuss that, and I want to, uh, please go ahead, please go ahead. Maybe I will talk to you privately also after that, through Skype or through emails. Go ahead, let me see the detailed pictures here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good. I agree with you that one has to do the, the, the boost, to put the, the non-linearly realized boost as well. When you yeah. do, when, yeah, yes, so I, so I believe that when we do that domain realization and try to write an effective theory from gravity, it will it, it will be neither Newtonian nor uh, Poincare gravity, but something will come up. I will discuss. We will discuss that. Please go ahead and complete your lecture. I mean, it's just the effective theory of inflation. What comes out when you do this? If you yeah, do that, point is that inflation the way we do only when we. Bring in perturbations, we are talking about the full space, everything. Before that, we assume a, uh, we, we always assume that, okay, uh, isotropic, homogeneous, inversity, but we are assuming here something extra, which the inflation, inflation as you are doing earlier, never assumed, you have, never assumed that the uh, Bush symmetry is spontaneously broken. This is something that is the main thing which has gone extra to this this theory we are talking now. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interested in hearing uh, what you're uh, what you're doing more more in detail. Thanks. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so rule number five. It's perhaps what I find the most interesting one because you finally learn about locality and. I don't think we understand locality very well in field theory in general. Uh, we, 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 we can disguise our, our lack of understanding by using a lot of symmetry, like when we use Lorentz symmetry. But when you lose that, I don't think that the, the rules are very clear. Uh, but uh, at, at least at the level of this object, I think they're, they're clear. Locality says that the denominator that before I wrote as a generic polynomial is not any polynomial. I mean, you can write like a random polynomial, but then the theory is not local. But if you want the theory to be local, what you should be writing is this object where, well, actually this exponent here in general is m, which has to be bigger or equal to three. But in the simplest models, like such as those that are relevant for um, single field inflation, that exponent is gonna be three. But in general, that exponent could be uh, bigger than three. And then the kt to the p. So no other factor can appear. You cannot write down something like, uh, some other functions, I don't know, k1 minus k2, no, that's not allowed. Uh, something like e2, which I, I, I remind you, e2 was just a quadratic polynomial in the case. No, you cannot write that either. Okay, so only this particular combination is allowed in the denominator. And this, this rule is based on two things. One is locality and two is the choice of vacuum. So let's talk about the vacuum first. If you didn't choose the vacuum, then you could have other poles. If you chose a different vacuum, you could have the poles that, that I, I wrote down before, which it looks like K1 minus K2 plus K3. Then those poles can appear if you have non bunch Davis.
But if you insist on bunch Davis, then they have to go away. Um, the other statement is about locality. If you write down arbitrary no local interactions like one over Laplacian to the 32 and then some operator, then you will get additional powers here. Uh, but if you insist on the theory being local, then that's not allowed. Uh, there is much more to be said about locality and I don't have um, the time to discuss it. And I think it's, it's a much richer subject, but I'll leave it at that for this discussion. So this is extremely powerful, perhaps the most powerful rule that we have had so far, because now the whole problem of finding the result consists in finding out this polynomial. This polynomial is a finite degree, right? You see here the degree of the polynomial is given by three, which is known, P is the number of derivatives, and alpha was how many case you use polarization this polynomial in a fixed number of variables so you just write it down it has a certain number of free parameters and those free parameters are the coupling constant of the theory um, and that's 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 your answer um, so this is pure without writing the, the coupling constant and doing the calculation so finally, the last rule is that if you, if you use rules one through five, what you're computing is the correlation function of some field. But if you insist that that field that you're computing is zeta or gamma, or the, sorry, the gravitons or the curvature perturbations, which is what you wanna tell your, your colleague observers about, then you have also to impose the soft theorems that we reviewed before. The soft theorems have some explicit form. This is the one that I've written down before, like the Maldacena subscalar. And this is the, so when the, when the scalar is soft, and this is when the graviton is soft. And there are some expressions that have been worked out in the literature in a series of papers. So if you, yeah, you have to impose those. Okay, so finally, all of these rules are over and I can give you an example, which hopefully it is illuminating, uh, unless there are further questions. So the example is, it was actually not the simplest calculation. If you actually did this from scratch, starting from, uh, yeah, from the Einstein, Hilbert, Lagrangian, et cetera, it would take a little bit of, of work. Uh, and it's the, the three graviton, okay? So gamma, gamma, gamma. This was first derived by Maldacena almost years ago. And it was rederived later on using the Sitter isometries in Maldacena and Pimentel. But here we will derive it without ever talking about the Sitter boosts, okay? Just from the boost up rules. Okay, so what are the rules? The rules are write down um, um, a polarization factor and a trim by spectrum, and then ensure that in the limit of KT going to zero, this coincides with the amplitude. So let's write down the amplitude. This is the amplitude. That's, it's, it's a well-known amplitude for three gravitons in flat space. It's very easy to write it down in terms of spin or elicity variables, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, um, it doesn't matter, uh, so I'm not even gonna bother. Um, write it down. Clearly it contains three polarization because there are three fields. Each one of them has a polarization, H1, H2, H3. And this T here is something which is linear in K such that this whole amplitude is quadratic in derivative. There is one derivative here, one derivative here. And that's good because this is exactly the, the amplitude that corresponds to the Einstein-Hilbert term, right? Einstein-Hilbert term is just R square root of G has two derivatives. And so the amplitude has two derivatives. One is here and, and this appears twice. Okay, so now we wanna write down uh, an answer for the correlator such that when we take KT to zero on the largest pole, it has, it gives me exactly this factor, which is the same as the amplitude. But then I know nothing about the subleading terms in KT. And I wanna write that to have the right scaling dimension. So such so that B goes like one over K to the six. And I claim that this thing that I've written down is the most generic rational function that has that property. It's easy to see that it goes like K to the six because here there are three, deri three derivatives, four, five divided by nine plus two, 11. 11, uh, uh, five minus 11 is minus six, which is exactly a scaling variance. So this, this is good. Uh, now the coefficient of this first term, this is the only term that survives when you take KT to zero, right? Because here there is one KT and here there is another. So those two do not survive in the, um, 
in the amplitude limit. So this coefficient here is the one that is fixed by the amplitude. So I don't write the free parameter in front. The free parameter is just the amplitude itself, as I've written. On the other hand, this, there are two other things that I can write down in terms of the momenta. Just, just to make it clear, this E2, remember, is just something quadratic in the momenta. It's the sum of Ka, Kb, and this, um, yeah. uh, and so that has a free coefficient C1 and a C coefficient C3. So see how powerful this bootstrap rules were. I basically got almost to the solution in just one line. Now, the only thing I don't know are this, this C1 and C3 are just numbers. Okay, so now the whole work that I have to do that is an actual calculation is to find out which number this is. Is it three or one over 17 or something like that? Okay, so it's extremely powerful. How do you determine those numbers? Then you use the soft theorems. So you take this expression, you compute the soft theorem when one graviton goes to zero and you enforce that it has this soft theorem behavior and that fixes the value of this two coefficient. The leading orders of theorems is this. Clearly are equations that have the only two unknowns in the problem, C1 and C3. And there are two equations, two unknowns. The solution is C1 and C3 is minus one. Boom, that's the solution. And this is exactly what Maldacena computed uh, 20 years ago. But as you appreciate, the derivation was uh, almost trivial. It was, it was extremely straightforward. Any question on this, on this example? Okay, no. <clears throat> uh, okay, then I'm gonna give you some other example. Since this one was so easy, we can do something, something else. Let's do gamma zeta zeta. This was also computed by Maldacena. And then again, um, uh, it was rederived using the zeta isometries in this paper. Uh, and actually this one is just as easy. Uh, and in fact, the calculation is very similar. So again, we start from an amplitude. You tell me what it is the amplitude that you want it to correspond to in flat space. This is just the standard amplitude that you would have from an interaction of the form gamma ij, di phi, dj phi, if you want to have some intuition. But you don't need to write down this. You can derive this amplitude exclusively based on, let's say, spinor helicity formalism, if you, if you like to. Uh, that's the amplitude. And now we write down an answer that has that as, as a leading KT term, and then we write subleading stuff. So the, the polarization factor is completely fixed by the amplitude. The denominator is fixed by, the, the, by rule uh, five. And then you only have two free coefficients. And those free coefficients, again, uh, are uh, fixed by taking the soft limit. The soft limit means that you take limit uh, well, there are two soft limits, limit of K1 going to zero, that's the first soft limit, and the other is limit of K2 going to zero. The K3 is the same as K2 by symmetry. So you take those two soft limits, it turns out that the soft scalar limit doesn't tell you anything, but the soft graviton limit gives you two equations, which are the same as before. It's trivial to solve them, the solution is C1 equals one and C3 equals minus one. And this is again the calculation, the result that Maldacena got um, doing the explicit calculation. But again, it, it took us just um, half a page. Okay, so we can go on. And there are many other things that we could be computing. Um, I'm gonna give you some examples. And among these examples, I'm gonna show you something new. I mean, so far I've just, just rederiving things that were already known, but you can also use this method to compute something new that had not, not been computed before. So I'm gonna go to the most interesting one, which is the scalar by spectrum. This is the most phenomenologically relevant one. This is the one that people want to measure in the CMB and large scale structure. This is the one that uh, people think about when they talk about primordial non-Gaussianities. So, so far, we always considered Lorentz invariant amplitudes. 
but actually, since we said that boosts are not linearly realized, you can also consider amplitudes that are not linearly invariant under boosts, or if you want boost breaking amplitudes. And those amplitudes were recently classified and discussed in a, in a paper. Uh, and so we know what they look like. For scalars, these amplitudes are very simple. They're just arbitrary function of the energies, which are uh, invariant under rotations and translations. So in this talk, I will give you some specific uh, examples, but in principle, you can extend this to many other more complicated examples. So the first example that I wanna discuss is the example in which we do take a Lorentz invariant amplitude. Um, and the, we take the simplest one. Basically, we take the amplitude that would correspond to a phi cube interaction. Clearly, I can think of this as emerging in every canonical single field model, just when you expand the potential to cubic order. And so the amplitude is just V triple prime itself. Um, and if you, you can just call it V triple prime, but you can also give it some fancy slow roll name by using uh, some background slow roll equation. And I use this just to match with the literature, but you don't have to, you can just call it V triple prime, it's the same thing. So then we wanna write the most generic correlator that in when kt is zero reduces to this amplitude. And now we get something new. How many derivatives are present here? Zero derivatives. And so the value of p is zero. So when the value of p is zero, that is, remember p was non-negative. So p equals zero is kind of a limiting case. Uh, and that limiting case, the formula is slightly modified. And instead of being one over kt to the zero, that that kt to the zero becomes a log. And that's something that we derived. And so we have an explicit expression for that as well. So this is the, the only exception to the case of the function being just a rational function. Now it's a rational function, but you can have some logs of kt. So the most generic bispectrum now has six terms, three that are proportional to the log and three without the log. And you know that there are only these because these are the only one that scales like one over k to the six. There cannot be one over kt because there are no derivatives. And so there are only, uh, there are six free coefficients, but one of them is fixed by the amplitude limit. So five free coefficients. Uh, and then you can take the soft limits and the soft limits, they have a leading order soft limits and next to leading order soft limit. But now the terms with the log and without the log, they have to cancel separately. And so you get four equations which you can solve. Uh, so that means that you're down from five coefficient and you can fix four of them. So you're left with one coefficient. I think this additional coefficient can be fixed using uh, the N and LO soft limit, but I haven't had the, the power to do it. Um, so that's uh, still to be done. If you were to use the Sitter boost, which I don't want to, you could fix it and you would find some value. Uh, but I think it could be used without doing boost. You could also use the uh, next to leading order term, but I haven't done it in my paper. So that would be something to, to do. And uh, sure enough, you get the right result. This result was computed, uh, well, in a series of papers, but this, this is one reference. Um, and you get the right result, not, not, not surprisingly. This is what people call the conformal uh, non-Gaussianity or the conformal limit of, of non-Gaussianity. Okay, finally, let me, let me conclude this list of examples uh, with, um, with something uh, that people are familiar with. This is gonna reproduce FNL equilateral, FNL orthogonal. Um, decide to work at, uh, as you would do in the effective theory of inflation. If some people are familiar with it, otherwise just think that we are working at the level of three derivatives. Um, if we have three derivatives, then this exponent, this value of P is three. And then you write down the most generic polynomial upstairs of degree uh, six, such that the whole thing is one over K to the six. And this is the most generic polynomial. And then you start by imposing um, that the amplitude limit is local. And that says that this operator cannot appear. And then you're left with six parameters, 
But now you have a soft theorem, and that removes it and brings down to five uh, uh, to five parameters. And sure enough, those five parameters are nothing but FNL equilota, FNL orthogonal, epsilon, eta, and S, where S is defined to be the variation of the speed of sound uh, dimensionless. So very powerful. So this very simple derivation actually redirived the bispectrum uh, that was computed uh, well in this paper for P of X theories, or you can also recompute it using the effective theory of inflation. And these are the famous non-Gaussian parameters that people are trying to, to measure in the sky. And they correspond to linear combination of these uh, five free parameters that I'm left with. So again, this derivation was much, much, much simpler than the actual one. In particular, I didn't have to solve any constraints from coming from gravity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in fact, this derivation was so simple that you can generalize it to any number of derivatives. So rather than all number of derivatives, let me call it any number of derivatives. Uh, okay, so to any number of derivatives, this is the solution. You write down the most generic polynomial. I, I, I have an explicit formula in my paper. Uh, I, I didn't write it here because it's, it's a bit long, but it's relatively simple. And that contains some free parameters and the free parameters are the coupling constants in the theory and they're all of them free except for the relation given by the soft theorem. And so this gives you the result for the bispectrum to any order in derivatives in the EFT of inflation. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty, uh, it's a slick way of, of deriving it. Um, okay, so it would be nice, there is much more to do. So here, for example, there are also uh, interactions involving gravitons that are non Lorentz invariant. And I did not compute them in this paper. And that would be something that is very interesting to do. People have studied and done only preliminary investigations of that in the literature using the Lagrangian. And I, in fact, pretty much only know these two papers by Cabas, Bourdin, Criminelli, and company. Um, but uh, so doing this calculation using this method, one would, would be the first time that this uh, bispectra are ever computed. And some of these bispectra are actually larger than the one that comes from gravity. So they would be the leading target for future uh, graviton non Gaussianity searches. So I think it's very interesting to do and, and the formalism is, uh, is available. So I'm gonna stop there and ask if there are some questions. I know it's, it's long. Lecture and people are getting tired, but if there are some questions, please, please uh, shoot. Do you ever take breaks during the, the lecture or just go straight to the end? You can take a bit if you want. Like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. I'll, I'll, I'll just finish it. I was just wondering if it was customary. I'll just conclude with the last topic. I think I should be done in, in 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, please, please. Okay, so the last topic is that so far we did, uh, well, we did quite well because we didn't use boosts. We had a bunch of rules and then we could compute pretty much uh, uh, all of these uh, three-point functions involving gravitons and scalars, or no, the scaling variant three-point functions. But what if you want to go to like four-point functions or n-point functions, how do you continue? Well, just these rules are going to be hard to, to apply to four and five point function because there are so many more variables that, that, that could appear there. And so this is where, in fact, the other thing notice that so far, even though I told you that I was going to use unitarity, actually, I never used unitarity so far. I only use locality and symmetries. But we have to use unitarity, at least we think that's a pillar of quantum mechanics and therefore of fundamental interaction. So what are the consequences of unitarity? And that's the, the topic of, uh, of this last part. Classic. Uh, the consequences of unitarity. Um, and just as in, uh, in particle physics, uh, this, the simplest consequence of unitarity is the optical theorem. So again, uh, that's what I'm gonna derive here, but I'm gonna derive it for correlators. Okay, so uh, so, so far we said uh, 
what we have done only treatment function that was, was easy because it was just contact interactions. There was no propagation. Um, but when you start um, when you start having particles that propagate, then things are more complicated. And then you really have to use unitarity. So let's see how that works. Well, first of all, it's just one of the pillars of, of, of physics uh, because of, it's a pillar of quantum mechanics. Um, and the consequences are very understood for particle physics in the optical theorem and in the cutting rules uh, that you can find in pretty much any QFT book. But now we're talking about unitarity of a time evolution that we never observe. Right? The, whole, the whole talk was based on, let's make prediction for cosmological correlators in the future without ever mentioning the time evolution. So how is something like unitarity of time evolution encoded in an object that doesn't contain time? These correlators that we have been computed are only spatial correlators. They only live on a spatial hypersurface at future infinity. How do they know about time? There is no time evolution there. There is no time. Time has disappeared. And so this is why this is particularly exciting is that actually that particular shape of that spatial correlators knows secretly about the fact that this thing comes from time evolution. So in some sense, time emerges as a concept on the boundary because of these unitarity constraints that I'm gonna derive. Um, so I'm gonna derive a set of conditions. I don't claim that these are necessary and sufficient for the theory is unitary, but definitely they are necessary. There might be additional conditions. Uh, and so instead of deriving, it turns out that correlators are not the best object to discuss, to derive the consequences of unitarities. It's much better to discuss the wave function of the universe. This is closely related to correlators. In fact, you can go back and forth. If I give you all the correlators at a certain order, you can get the wave function and vice versa. Uh, but uh, the optical theorem and unitarity are much more easily expressed in terms of the wave function. And this is to be expected because correlators by their nature are real real objects. Well, if you take the exploitation value of um, Hermitian operators, but um, but unitarity has to do with the phases of stuff. No, it has to do with complex numbers and e to the i, omega t as you go. And so it is perhaps intuitive that it will be hard to express it well in terms of correlators. Uh, it's much better expressed in terms of the wave function. Uh, so this wave function is just the same thing as in, a, in the Schrodinger picture. If you want to take the expectation value of some operator, then this is the, an integral. Now it's a path integral in V phi of the wave function, which is now a function now, square, wave function square, uh, and then you have the operator. So the, the wave function is just the same thing that you have uh, uh, when you do a uh, Schrodinger uh, picture in quantum mechanics. But now we are just doing it for fields. And the main object that I'm going to constrain are the coefficient of this wave function. So if I write down without loss of generality, this, this wave function as the exponential of something, uh, which is the most generic expansion in powers of the fields, uh, I'm going to constrain this coefficient. You can think of those coefficients to be just the, the cousins of the endpoint functions. And in fact, to, in perturbation theory, they are related to each other. Questions on the wave function? Uh, this relation about psi phi and this thing are written down, that is true for all types, right? For any type. The relation between psi and? Right hand side exponential, this thing are written. Right hand side does not know anything about type, right? Uh, the right and left hand side of, of this equation here? Yeah, the equation you have written between psi pi and the exponential minus these things. There is, right hand side doesn't know anything about time. Uh, well, both sides, uh, in principle, both sides depend on time. This depends on time and this depends on time. But now we are taking the time going to plus infinity on both sides. So, so you're right. I could be computing the, the wave function at, at any given time. Absolutely, you're right. But this, now, equation is true. this equation is true for any time, right? This equation is true for any time, but I'm only going to use it. At what, is the, what is the unitary evolution you are talking about now? The unitary evolution is the, the fact that this wave function evolves unitary as a function of time in a unitary way. Oh, because when they don't depend on time, 
How do I make a unitary, unitary transfer method? I mean, the wave function, it's just one quantum mechanics. The wave function does depend on time. And now I'm computing it. I'm taking the limit of time going to infinity. No, in the quantum mechanics, I know the system of the work function at a given time, and I unitarily evolve it to another time. But here it does not depend on time altogether. It's true for all time. Even if I do unitary transformation or do non-unitary transformation, that will not distinguish me anything. No, 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 I disagree. This, this, the wave function in, in the sitter does depend on time. But, but it, your equation does not depend on time. Yes, yes, there is a time dependence here, comma t, and there is a time dependence here. Psi n. Psi n, you put the time dependence? Psi n of t, yes. Oh. Yeah. So everything is time dependent. However, so everything is time dependent, just in quantum, like in quantum mechanics, it all depends on time, but I'm not going to compute it at any time t, I'm only going to compute it at t equals infinity. Then this psi n t, how do I determine the initial time of psi n t in the right hand side? What it determines? How do I determine that? Or it's an assumption? How do you determine, how do you compute this psi n of t? Yes. I did the Schrodinger equation. So, I dt psi was h psi. The yeah, psi is a function of time. Yeah, the point is that there is psi n. So when I say, you are saying psi pi t in the left hand side, the t dependence comes through pi or you have put it ad hoc -ly. This phi here doesn't depend. Uh, this phi, in some sense, is phi of just Does patient. it depend on time? Does it depend on time? Doesn't depend on time. It's the, the left hand side, The time dependence of the left hand side, how does it arise? Well, it's a function of time. Which one? Phi? Phi is a function of time separately from phi. Phi is a function of time. Yes, you define phi k1 to phi kn. Why are not they defined in a function of time? But psi n is a function of time. No, pi, pi k1, pi k n, they could be different on different times, right? No, not in this one. Why can you pull them together to psi n t? Why is the pi k1 to pi k n, all the fields pi depend on the same time? That's what I don't understand. Okay, so there is no time dependence in phi. So the only time dependence left is- hand side, Left hand side, Time dependence comes through pi, right? No. Then? No. Psi, psi is a functional of pi with respect to time. No, no, the answer so is. Comes, it can come the time dependence through pi. No, it doesn't depend on time. Psi is a pi. Let's yeah. say that psi, psi is the size of function which depends on time through the time dependence of pi. No, that's, that's incorrect. That's not it. How will you how will you try to how do I know that how psi depends on time? Well, but the dynamics which tells me that how psi at a given time t1 to go to t2. Quantum mechanics. The wave function it looks like e to the i omega t e to the minus x square, the wave function of the harmonic oscillator. Yeah, I know. This t that that's x. I depends on that. That's because the x. Here, what is happening here in the, the one you wrote down? You are writing psi is a function of this is this this example is not correct. This is psi is a function of x and t, that's why you call the policy here. But now this psi is a functional of time. The time dependence in the left hand side comes through the time dependence of pi. Yeah, I don't know, I don't think so. No, that's, that's, no. Oh, sorry. And because the psi is here is the dependence on coordinate and time. It is it depends on three pi. <laughs> Maybe we can discussion some other some other time, but I, I, I disagree. Right, right, right. That's not the right interpretation. Um, very good. So, so now this is uh, just the wave function which you solve, uh, which you find either solving the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but I'm only going to be interested in the value of this wave function on the boundary. So when, when time goes to plus infinity. Um, and so now you can start from a simple observation, which is the fact that u, where u is the time evolution. So is equal time evolution in the bulk. 
Um, well, it's unitary, and by unitary we mean the UU dagger is the identity. Uh, <clears throat> and then, starting from that, in, in this paper, we were able to, um, to compute the simple relations that are valid for contact diagrams. So for all diagrams in which you only have one interaction and any number of external legs, then the, the wave function coefficient that has to obey this relation. The relation is relatively simple. It says that if you take that psi n, which is, you can think of it as being a cousin of the endpoint correlator, and you evaluate it with whatever value of E1 of the momenta, and you sum to itself its complex conjugate, complex conjugate with an analytic. What, the, what, what does the prime mean here? Derivative prime is the deriv some derivative? Derivative with respect to what? Very good question. Prime is not a derivative. Prime means that I dropped the delta function. I dropped a momentum conserving delta function. I so see. maybe the, the, the equation would have been neater without the prime. But prime is just to remind ourselves that in principle, I'm not writing down delta function. The equation is also valid without writing the prime. Still the same equation. And this equation is true for all types? Uh, this equation is true um, at the boundary, but uh, it, it is also true, uh, as was showed by uh, Scott Melville and collaborators, uh, is true at, as the function of time. But that, um, it, so, so the time derivative of this equation, if you were to, to evaluate it as a function of time, the time derivative of this would be zero. So this would be valid at all times. But okay. here, I'm writing the value of this equation and the future infinity, which is where we measure it. So how do you know which is future infinity or past infinity or any given time? Because this equation does not have any time dependence. In the, okay. last, in the previous page, you told the time dependence comes through psi n. This is now I told if it, is true, if it is true for all time, how do I, how do I define in this relation what is my past infinity and future infinity, or for that matter, any given time. Here I'm evaluating a relation that is valid at any time, and I'm evaluating it at future infinity, and I'm only writing the value at future infinity. Okay, so so the at given time, the equation looks different. You have, the, you have written down this equation only in uh, past infinity, right? Uh, in general, right. Yes. Okay. In general, the equation will look psi n of k comma t, yeah. Plus psi you have, you have gone to t equal to minus infinity. This is what the equation looks like. R equals zero. This would be the equation at every time. And now I'll take the limit of this equation for time going to uh, plus infinity. And so I yeah. drop the argument t. Okay, 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 okay. Right. Oops. Um, very good. So this is actually very useful. I don't think this uh, such identity was known, and maybe it might seem pretty trivial at the level of, of contact terms, but it already has some non-trivial implication. First of all, at perhaps a more philosophical levels, this is the equivalent of emission analyticity for for amplitudes. If, if any of you have ever studied amplitudes, there is an, an important uh, result there, which is called emission analyticity. This is somehow the equivalent statement, the fact that a, a of s is equal a star of s star, where s is the Mandelstam variable. Um, it's just a comment. The second comment is that already this, this has some interesting implications. For example, if you take that expression and apply it to IR uh, finite wave functions for, um, um, for any number of uh, massless scalars and any number of conformally coupled fields. So if you apply this uh, to uh, with any number of massless uh, scalar, let me call the var phi the conformally coupled one and any number of massless, let me call them phi. Well, then I claim that this object because of unitarity, the imaginary part of this has to be zero when n is even or the real part of this has to be zero when n is odd. Um, it's something that you can check by doing the calculation. Uh, and it's cool here that you can see explicitly that it's just a consequence of unitarity. So even though it's pretty simple at, at this level because we are still at contact level, it still has non-trivial implication. It's a little bit more interesting when you have uh, IR divergent interactions. Huh? For example, interaction like phi cube in the sitter is famously IR divergent. And then this unitarity gives you an interesting relation between uh, the imaginary part of psi, which is what I, I, I've shown here, this is the imaginary part, and um, 
the IR divergent part, which comes with a log. You might see that these coefficients are exactly the same. You will see that this three here is the same as this three here, and this three here is the same as this one, and this one here is the same as this. So all of these terms uh, cancel each other when you write down the cosmological optical theorem. And in some sense, it tells you that if something is IR divergent, then the, way the, the associated wave function is to have an imaginary part. If they are divergences, is a log. It has also more implications, but I don't have time to discuss them here. Perhaps more interesting is to write down this optical theorem when you have exchange diagrams. So schematically, this would be diagrams of the form uh, you have an interaction. Uh, and then something propagate, and then you have another interaction. So this is a four point function for four particles, one, two, three, and four, and then plus permutations. Um, then this wave function has to obey this thing that uh, something that looks like the real, uh, looks like the real part of the Psi four. So Psi four plus Psi four with a star, but crucially, you have to analytically continue the energies to minus themselves, actually ends up being just fixed by a three-point function. So you see this, what's powerful about this equation is that it tells me that something that is some Psi four is related to something which has only Psi three squared. So it, it has that flavor of determining more complicated diagrams, higher point function in terms of lower point functions, which is exactly what happens for the optical theorem um, in flat space. Uh, even more powerful, this relation determines all possible singularities of Psi-4. So this Psi-4 um, has a certain analytic, uh, has dependence on its kinematical variables, and that dependence has some analytical properties. There are a bunch of poles, and if you go uh, for more complicated particles, like massive particles, you can have branch cuts as well. Uh, but this relation, for example, for massless particles, determines all of the analytical structure because it tells you that all the poles that this object can have are this partial energy singularity that appears in the lower endpoint function. This corresponds to the partial energy singularity of the three point function here. And this expression dictates it. So it's extremely powerful. And in fact, it's so powerful that you can use it to bootstrap the four point function from the three point function. In some sense, yeah, you can even prove formally that this has to be the case because up to terms that, that are contact terms. So this expression will not fix terms that are of this four point function that are of this type. Those uh, vanish by themselves on the left hand side of this equation. And so the hope is that we will be able to write down some form of factorization theorems or recursion relations in which the four point functions are derived from lower point function. In the first part of the talk, I showed you how to derive the three point functions. And from those, you should be able to build any endpoint function going through this. Um, actually, we I have would... a... Yes. Sorry, what is this P, uh, polynomial in uh, S in front? Maybe you said it. Uh, just... Oh, I'm sorry, this is the power spectrum. Okay. Thank you. So for example, if you were in the, um, uh, in inflation in the seat, that this would be just one over K cube. Yeah, that it, it's in some sense it's kind of trivial because, um, uh, well, maybe it's not trivial. I mean, it, it, it's just because of the scaling of the number of fields. You have four on one side and six on the other, so you have to take two out so that it matches. But that is just the power spectrum, so it's one over s cube. Yeah, thanks, thanks. I wasn't. So here, I, here, this is I've written this expression for some field phi that exchange a field. Uh, sigma, but you can also have phi, phi, phi if you want, or you can exchange a graviton. In fact, this relation can be generalized to any endpoint function for fields of any mass and any spin, and is always valid, and it's pretty much the same expression. You just have to sum over the helicity of the exchange particles. And we already have this proof based on uh, cutting rules, but I didn't write slides on this. But just as in uh, flat space, you can prove this from uh, uh, explicitly cutting diagram, diagram by diagram, the propagators. 
good. Actually, what's cool about this is that for massless fields, and only for massless fields, uh, you can rewrite this expression in terms of a similar expression that involves exactly the correlator. This is the one, uh, the, the trispectrum. This is the one that you, you look for in the CMB. And this is the bispectrum. And so you can rewrite that expression just in terms of the trispectrum and bispectrum. And it tells you the, the trispectrum is given in terms of the bispectrum. So if you fix one, the other one follows up to contact interactions again. So contact interaction are stuff that vanishes just on the left hand side. And in fact, we have checked this relation for calculations that were performed in the theories with, uh, with more derivatives, we have X theories or uh, the exchange of a graviton. And it, in, indeed, it always works as, as it had to be. So it's actually very powerful. In principle, you can use this to not to compute the graviton exchange or the scalar exchange because it should all be, be dictated by, in some sense, by unitarity and lower endpoint functions, just as it happens for, uh, for amplitudes. Okay, well, I'm coming towards uh, the end of this discussion, which is great because it's about two hours into this. So the goal here was to try to see how much we can say without making a un well, un uncheckable assumption about the time evolution during inflation, which is something we don't observe. So we're trying to just formulate rules that have only something to do with what we actually observe. Uh, which is the, the correlators at late time. So this is the, this bootstrap approach. Uh, and these rules should be grounded in what we think is true uh, for fundamental interactions. So we think it's a quantum mechanical theory. So it has unitarity. We, we believe that uh, experiments made here do not affect experiments made on another galaxy instantly. And so there should be some form of locality. And you can select what your symmetries are. And, and we discuss this symmetry. And the approach is very powerful. Actually, you can derive a bunch of bispectra extremely easily in just a few lines of calculations, in particular bispectra including scalars and gravitons. And you could, uh, I could extend the, the calculation of the bispectrum in the EFT of inflation to any number of derivatives. What's even more exciting is that once we comp compute this three-point function, then we can use unitarity in the form of the cosmological optical theorem to uh, construct higher endpoint functions. Um, and that's something that I haven't proven or done, but uh, it's, it's, it's in progress. And that's, uh, that's extremely exciting. And that's, of course, how uh, on-shell methods work for, for amplitudes in flat space. So something similar uh, seems to be uh, at play here. And I just wanted to mention some open questions or things that people could be interested in thinking about or working on. And I think locality is fully understood in this series. So if I gave you a three-point correlator, I think we still don't know what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for it to come from a local theory. Uh, I don't think we have finished computing all possible correlators, including tensors, especially the, the correlators that come in the effective theory of inflation with tensors have not been computed, although they should follow from these rules. Uh, you can derive all of these rules and extend them using cutting rules, and that's something that will appear uh, soon. Uh, and perhaps on the observational side, this really stresses the importance of uh, certain specific poles in the calculation, in particular, the total energy pole. So I'm going to uh, stop there and, uh, and pause for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Enrico, for your outstanding contribution. And, uh, it's very elaborative and in detail, and I I'm very hopeful that when it will be posted in YouTube, people will be surely benefited. Now, those who are already attending, if you have any further uh, very urgent questions, then only please ask because I don't want to put uh, further constraint on him because it is more than uh, two hours he spoke, and uh, I am hopeful that Enrico, you also have enjoyed <laughs> there are lots of questions lots of discussions we have learned a lot and uh, yeah that's that's the like main goal of this program to learn and uh, we ask many questions and uh, hopefully you will also enjoy it from our side uh, that uh, yeah so you just didn't spoke to the uh, 
uh, screen. You spoke to the real people. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you, that was very nice. Thanks a lot. Uh, you want to say something? Sorry. No, I said thanks for the question. I think they have a lot making the presentation more clear. Uh, I think that was very useful. Thank you. Uh, so if uh, the audiences, do, uh, if you have any question, very particular question, please ask. Or otherwise, uh, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Enrico for giving such a nice contribution. So can I ask a question very quickly? Yeah. So you can ask. Anybody can ask what question. I wanted just to ask if, uh, so this constraint that comes from unitary that you showed at the end, this is trivial on the three point function. It doesn't add any further uh, constraint. Uh, for the correlator is trivial. It just says that the correlator is, uh, is real. Uh, although it's, if, it, if you look at the correlator involving conformal cable field, it tells you that sometimes it's zero, which in fact it is. It's maybe not super trivial. I mean, it's something that you can compute and it is true. But if you didn't know, for example, I didn't know that the correlator of an odd number of conformal coupled field is always zero, but it's true. Even for 75 uh, conformal coupled field and any number of massless, zero. Uh, this is just for contact. Uh, it's also true for the bias spectrum if you put one or three. Interesting, thank you. But you said that any of this constraint, for example, uh, could ever be used to um, force you on a choice of a vacuum, for example. Or, I mean, in a way, since this is compatible with your symmetry, probably the, the ambiguity will always be there. That's a good question. The way I formulated this optical theorem, I was assuming the vacuum. Uh, there is another interesting paper by Scott Melville, uh, Cespedes, and Davis, um, in which they don't assume a bunch Davis vacuum. And they show that they can also rederive this cosmological optical theorem. Uh, but then instead of that expression being equal to zero, they show that that expression is equal to whatever it was at the beginning in the initial state. So there is some information about the initial state that is conserved by unitary evolution. Um, so I don't think you can use that to fix the initial state, but you can use it to read off some property of the initial state. I mean, just in, in any theory, there is no theory that tells you what initial state you can choose. That's usually a differential equation and you can solve, choose your initial condition and then evolve. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely that you will find the rule unless there is something deeper. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, very interesting thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the lecture. I have no curiosity to uh, ask Enrico one more thing that the outstanding uh, slides where some drawings are there. So, who, who, who is the creator for that? You are the one. Oh no, no, I wasn't. I should have. I should have credited it. I, I'll, I'll do it next time. Good point. <laughs> yeah, those slides are excellent. Yeah. So, any more questions or comments? Yeah, I, I have one question now. Question or I have a doubt. Uh, yeah. Enrico, the Mach Davis vacuum, uh, that is defined, which is invariant also under boost. Right? Sorry, what was what is invariant under boost? I didn't the Mach Davis vacuum, where, which you are using for computing or correlation. Yeah, yeah you're right. It, Invariant under boost. Yes. But now we have thrown away the boost symmetry. Are you still justified using Bonds Davis backup or some other backup solution is admissible by our theory? Yeah, yeah, but, symmetry yeah, point of view. Actually, yeah, sorry, so I take it back. So um, and what I'm using is not exactly the bunch Davis vacuum. And in fact, the vacuum I'm using is not invariant under the boost. It, it, okay. It's like almost a bunch of Davis vacuum with the standard mode function and only uh, 
positive frequencies, as, as it always is. But now I'm allowing for um, an arbitrary speed of sound that is different from one. So the particles in this vacuum are particles whose, um, um, whose dispersion relation or the on, on shell equation is E squared minus CS squared K squared equals zero with CS yes. not being equal to one is arbitrary. And a vacuum with those particles is not boost invariant because particles move at the speed which is not the speed of light. So if you boost it, uh, that, uh, that is not gonna be invariant. So in that sense, even if my vacuum is not boost invariant, and the reason is just because there is this infraton that fills the space. Yeah. And it is some kind of this, this quantity that makes this forms a bit more tolerant. That's a good point. Um, Almost, but it's not. Yeah. Okay, understood. Uh, like many symmetries, which are spontaneous broken, and there is a, somehow we can restore that symmetry. Yes. Do you have a, do you, have you understood in this picture how we can restore the symmetry? Well, if, if you do, if you look at higher and higher energies, uh, yeah. the, the, the breaking should, uh, should become a splitting effect, some kind of breaking higher and higher energies. And in amplitude, you would just crank up the kinematics uh, why here you cannot and it's more kinematic energy is there's no energy in this state. But here the equivalent of going to higher and higher energies is getting closer and closer to the KT going to zero pole. So in principle okay. there what I said before is that you get higher and higher poles in KT and so you get higher and higher and operate and at point you reach the cutoff of the factory theory and the expectation would be that whatever UV completion of that theory there is beyond the cutoff, presumably will have linearly realized boost. So that in the UV, you, you so find they, again. So if we, the only way we can get there is by bringing in linearly, <clears throat> linearly in boost, bring it back to our theory and some order, at some order we'll get back the restoration of this image. That's what yeah. your point is. At very high energies, you would. Unfortunately, the high energy limit, you can only reach it on the complex plane. But yes. What does it physically mean in the complex plane? Well, it's, it's not a, a, an actual choice of kinematics. I see. Um, but, from space type point of view, uh, that should not be a problem whether you are reaching in a complex plane. It's not space time point of view, right? The, the intuition from the space time point of view is this is an interaction that happens very, very early. Oh. And because of the red shift as the, the sphere expands in the past, it's a blue shift. Yeah. So if you go further back in time, they, when this interaction happened, the moment of those particle was huge, was actually much larger than the scale at which boosts are broken by the ground. And then at those very high scales, this infrared breaking, spontaneous breaking of boosts is irrelevant, and you should recover a uh, Lorentz invariant. Uh, Very good. Very good. Um, okay, I'm, I'm very satisfied with that. The other point I have is that the, when you say there are boundaries, are the boundaries boost invariant? The boundary is boost invariant because it's a conformal boundary and it is a special infinity. Um, I would oh, say okay. conformal, conformal symmetry takes into account of push symmetry, right? I mean, so uh, then you are I mean, assuming push symmetry. Really. Boost symmetry is broken by my choice of vacuum and my interactions. No, but I'm asking about the boundary. Yeah, the boundary is in is in the position of the boundary. The boundary. You have IR fine relators, then. Uh, and you can really take the limit of time going to infinity, then that is boost invariant. Yeah. Only in the time going to infinity limit. Yes, yeah. Otherwise, it's a conformal boundary. It's not a maybe maybe the word boundary is confusing. It's just the limit of t to infinity. Yeah, and the limit t going to infinity. I also don't know what happens to the boost at what? this time of the night. 
Really, the, the, I can't even think that thing will be infinity what is used. Now we know what we know what happens. They they become oh. operators that act only on the spatial coordinates, and they become special conformal transformation of the of an hypothetical dual CFT. Okay, so basically at that limit, full conformal symmetry is restored. We are telling the boundary is conformal invariant means. Uh, it is full conformal symmetry is restored. Well, it's, it's restored geometrically. The geometry is invariant under that conformal symmetry. But there is also an inflaton, which is some form of matter that fills space time, and that yeah. is not invariant under the center pool. So even though the geometry is. The geometry, uh, the ground geometry is invariant on the full symmetry, but the matter is not invariant on the full symmetry. Yeah, I mean, some limit. If you take finite epsilon, even the geometry is not. But if you take epsilon to zero, you can imagine the geometry is um, is invariant, but the, the background is not. The, the, the matter that fills the space time is not, because you take this epsilon to zero limit. So that's uh, it. it's not a global metric of our universe. So what is not a global? It's not the, the metric is not global to describe the universe. The metric is in the full, uh, yeah, that is just the, the sitter metric. But usually when you put something in the sitter, it's not the sitter anymore. Because that yeah, is something. When you take into, when you take into the, put in the matter in the visitor, there you lose the information that you are in the sitter. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, things start uh, expanding and red shifting. So the only thing you can put is a cosmological constant, but anything else, like matter of any form, is going to deform the sitter away and it's going to make it into an FL. Basically, we are trying to relax this boost symmetry only in the matter sector. The background geometry remains as usual, which is confirmed in the Yeah, there is a limit in which I can take, which is the absolute zero limit in which I can leave the geometry to this the boost invariant, but everything else not. And so the result is not boost invariant. Not oh, at least. So in that case, suppose I don't put the matter, uh, then my background geometry can be still Einstein geometry. The moment I bring the matter, Einstein, there is a conspiracy between Einstein geometry along with the matter. So possibility is not a minimal coupling with my background. And together, when I look into the matter and geometry, I'm losing that push symmetry. Can I understand that way? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And okay. you're obliged to okay. put something. Otherwise, there is cosmologically, there is nothing to observe. I mean, you can talk about the, the, the Gedanken experiment of a scalar field in the sitter. But in practice, what we measure in our universe is not exactly the sitter. It's, it's, in fact, it's exactly the deviation from the sitter, the thing that we measure. Curvature yes, I, 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 yeah. now, now, I, now I get the full philosophy of that, and I'm happy. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks a lot. OK, so Enrico, bye. Stay safe and healthy. Maybe thanks, sir. Uh, some other uh, time i will invite you again with you will give some talk with new idea and uh, it was really nice talk and i will share the link once it will be posted okay. thank you very much with pleasure take care yeah.